So perhaps uh, before starting, just a remark about how uh, did my interest <coughs> in um, Emma Kuhn's uh, spark. Actually, I'm working on a doctoral uh, research which aims to investigate the gothic imagination of the weightless body in that respect, while studying the depiction of the imponderable energy uh, and energy such as electricity, but also the play with the force of gravity. I found uh, Emma Kuntz uh, that kept appearing in my readings and uh, which used gravity in her creative processes with the pendulum um, and used imponderable uh, energies in a revival of the romantic vision. I think also that uh, she can be integrated in what Linda Dalrymple Henderson um, as coined as a vibratory modernism, uh, which is a perspective that helped enlarging uh, the alternative history of modernism um, and that has emerged basically uh, since 1986 in the history of art with the seminal exhibition, uh, The Spiritual in Art. So a modernism which offers a diverse view on modernity and its positivism. Concerning Olga Freud de Kastein, I have initiated my research on her work only very recently and must admit that she gripped me. So I've been fascinated by her. Uh, and what I am presenting today uh, is therefore to consider much more as a work in progress where I am bringing and opening questions uh, more than answering to them. So my talk um, is entitled uh, Olga Fodekastein and Emma Kuntz, Art as a Ritual? Question mark. And indeed, the two terms, ritual and art, an art in the expanded field, uh, are to be investigated in relation with these two visionary women from the same generation, living at a relatively close distance but who probably never met. Despite their distinctive social background, Olga Frode Kastein and Emma Kuntz developed a creative practice at the crossroad of healing, body and soul, art and research. Both dedicated their lives to study the nature of the universe and of humankind through the conception of a polysemic image Olga Frode Kastein's and Emma Kuntz's world were nurtured with interest in science and biology and by an opening to ancient, non-Western and vernacular cultures imbued with spiritual dimensions. In times of social and political unrest during the Second World War, they devoted themselves to their artistic practice, believing in its agency and its curative and reenchanting an art using geometric patterns and symbolism infused with their practice of weaving, so textile again, uh, archetypal images, ornaments, and with a thorough observation of the micro and the micro uh, cosmos, leading to the imagination of a singular cosmos that we are about to discover. So the work of both women, as it is the case of many practitioners, been brought to light for a wide audience uh, posthumously in what Marco Parzi has recently coined as a phenomenon of, quote, esoteric posthumousness. That is, according to Parzi, I quote, the, the inability or the unwillingness to have one's artistic work promoted and recognized during one's life, which projects the work into a temporary limbo of obscurity that may last decades or forever, end quote. The term esoteric here, uh, applied to Freude and Kunz, may be understood in its wide exception as the belief, practice, or study of alternative spirituality. The spiritual links between Emma Kunz and anthroposophy have been demonstrated in an analysis of the vocabulary <laughs> published in 1953, notably in the term Ville des Crestes, the 
vital force of nature. Not to mention that she uh, also practiced radiesthesia, the attempt at healing with rays and waves form that she probably thought emanated from her drawings. Quoting the last sentence of the introduction of our published explanation, the purpose of her images is to give joy. Olga Fröbe believed in astrology, as mentioned in a conference that she gave in New York in 1939, and was a close friend uh, of the English esoterist Alice, Alice Ann Bailey, sorry, who is said to have coined the expression New Age. Now, some uh, of the artworks by Fröbe are about to be shown at the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. And uh, Emma Kunz's work at Cultural Centre Center Tabacalera in San Sebastian in 2022. While her uh, art is, um, is presently exhibited in an exhibition of self taught artists in France, after having been also uh, exhibited globally. Some of Fröbe Kartain's and Emma Kunz's work have been at the core of several exhibitions lately, inviting contemporary artists dialogue directly or in the indirectly with them. Indeed, some contemporary artists, young and less young, have drawn inspiration by Emma Kunz's work, research, practice, and biography, which for now has had a major, recep has, has had a major reception compared to Olga Fröbe's. But these exhibitions showed also an indirect dialogue with her work that nevertheless informed, but were, the topicality of her practice, of their practice. The reception of the work by Olga Fröbe Kaptein and Emma Kunz is interesting in many ways, even if I'm not going to focus on that on my talk uh, today. Yasmin Afsha, curator at the Gustav's Arau, the very first museum where in 1973, the first showed uh, Kunz's drawing in an um, institutional context, described the redemption of Emma Kunz from being an eccentric case to a global phenomenon. It is worth underlining in that respect the fact that the gaze, a somehow patriarchal gaze, posed on Emma Kunz depended on a diffused idea of an ethereal woman ultra sensitive, navigating, navigating from the witch to the saints, which drove her power from pure intuition and read by imposing her hands on books. Meanwhile, we can consider that determined, clever, and strong, she was using her intuitive power and empathy like a sponge. She drew inspiration from the conversations she had with scientists, from the reading of popular science journals, her work has been exhibited in art world exhibitions, for example, or exhibitions which linked art and science. It is indeed, uh, it is in indeed um, difficult to pinpoint her work that goes beyond, be beyond strict definitions. And this is what Pilar uh, mentioned before with trying to drop uh, etiquette. And, uh, concerning uh, Olga Fröbe Kaptein's reception, it is quite surprising to uh, how little her artistic work and cultural research has been investigated so far. Perhaps this time in limbo uh, can be explained not only by rare consideration for marginal practice, um, alternative science, and women in art, but also within art history with the occupation of the symbolist art movement and its aids by uh, modernist visions of art history as well as the distrust toward psychoanalytical theories. But back to the 30s, the meditation place, as I quote um, Olga Fröbe, um, that she realized, that she realized in the 30s, <coughs> were displayed for some time uh, in the conference room of her house. Some works can now be permanently seen at the Casa Arte Museum in uh, Monte Verità. In a display, elaborated by Ahad Zeman. And it is interesting maybe to see that actually the same curators, Ahad Zeman and Massimiliano 
enjoy both intrigued by magic and functions of art, play the paramount role in the revalorization of further and rooted work. As for Ima Flintwit Rudolf uh, Steiner, there is for Olga Kotekapstein um, a before and after following her encounter with uh, Carl Gustav Jung. Although <laughs> Arpitches have been the main topic of their early correspondence, after Jung's vivid critics, she decided to remove her work from the lecture hall that she had built in 1928, following a dream she had in 1927, and she decided to keep their creation and preservation more private. To the historian of religion, Friedrich Heider, to whom she sent some photographs of her works, she mentions that she has made them to a meditative practice. He answers that the reproductions meditative symbolism and that the vivid color impressed him and the wife, giving them joy. Wherever it is joy or a feeling of frightening falseness, quoting another viewer, her painting has a certain effect. Art therapy works with that idea that forms have a psycho-affecting meaning. In 1930, from uh, the 20 paintings she had made, she chose 14 of them to reproduce with the screen print technique in Chile. Here I'm uh, showing you um, a picture uh, where Olga Fröbe-Kaplan is in uh, her home in uh, Ascona, uh, close to the Monte Delta. Uh, and uh, at the right, you see uh, the right wing, uh, right wing um, on her desk and she, that she probably consulted uh, in order to orientate her uh, research. So in which extent can we consider the creative practice of Kobe and Kuhn's uh, ritualistic, because this is the title also of my talk. Let's first uh, try to think of a working definition of the right that I take from Michel Fury, du rite comme le œuvre l'art contemporain. The right, uh, uh, according to an anthropological is a codified practice, a system of signs linking humans with the sacred. It implies precise gestures and protocols that can be made alone or shared and that has a symbolic function and meaning. It can involve rites of passage and process of healing. Levi Strauss, a modern individualization of artistic production with its iconic representation to the dimension, to the dimension of the anechoic working within the group. The reason for Levi Strauss, who analyzed the production in her archive traditions, the willingness to give to creation the power of a sign, changing the idea of fetishization of the object proper to our culture. In that respect, the notion of authorship is less important and therefore leads to the valorization of the artistic process in itself, conceived as a ritual. We, we could wonder if the codified protocol used by Emma Kunz, as we are going to see, and I can already say that uh, she um, used to ask a question to her patients or to herself. She used a tool, the pendulum, and she worked with numbers in order to produce a drawing to which a meaning then was attributed. And the fact that this meaning entered in a process of transformation and healing can be considered which makes use of ideal or fancy motor movements and chants. Olga Fröbe, for example, used the needle to search for images at the beginning of her quest in Dyer's library. <coughs> Olga Fröbe Kaplan and Emma Kuntz used their creative practice to find answers in the world order and to materialize invulnerable energy. They integrated orientation tools and automatic process within this scope, inventing creative protocols and rituals. The need to assemble and organize images in cross-cultural symposia, also through the depiction of Mandela figure, was made by Freud Kaptein at her desk, as you can see, uh, with a typewriter and an image of an old green rose under the eyes. She also used a long needle, 
um, and this is um, uh, also part, it can be considered part of the process of divination because the needles are sometimes used in the process of divination. Um, and not only, uh, but all the further concepts of astrology, but also the I Ching, the Chinese divinatory book of revelations. Richard Willem, the first translator of the latter, so of the I Ching, was indeed close to heaven. So for both women, uh, meditation or extreme concentration, a sort of ritualistic suspension of the body may be close to a liminal state actually doesn't have any artist a particular connection with a ritualistic practice within their creative <coughs> mode. So I open the question. Perhaps what makes Olga Trebe and Emma Kunz so special is the use of day drawings um, and the fact that day drawings are not only uh, uh, they have not an art of efficiency but they are uh, a process and they are think <coughs> Within a larger process of meditation for them and the viewer, and they, they were instrument of divination in the beginning. So, but before investigating, investigating further this question, let's have a look at who was uh, Olga Trebek Kapstein. Exactly. So, Olga Trebek Kapstein was born from a Dutch bourgeois family in London in 1881. Her mother was involved in feminist movements and while her father was an engineer and uh, with a passion for photography. Olga recalls in her correspondence that his laboratory had a strong impact on her as a child. She received a higher education in Zurich, first in outside art. Uh, she exhibited an embroidered blue in the Museum uh, of uh, Outside Art in Zurich, the one that you see in the right. Uh, and then um, also she received a, a She was also involved in some artistic partnership, uh, for example, of the atmosphere um, in Ascona. 
So there, in uh, her house by the Lake Maggiore, between 1926 and 1934, Olga Fröbe-Captain realized around 20, uh, 200 sorry, paintings in a refined geometrical and illuminated art deco style, synthesizing oriental, Christian, but also theosophical and mystical symbols. Uh, there are some uh, meditation plates realized between the 20s and the 30s. We can see that she creates a syncretic symbolism, mixing up references to Hebraism in what is perhaps the uh, angel Metatron in the left, uh, sent uh, according to tr the tradition to hers to guide people in the desert. Uh, we see a swastika in the right. Um, in the painting Polarity, we see that she uses the symbols of the yin and the yang, and in the right, in the painting The Eternal Flames and in their triple unity, she may allude uh, to the alliance of diverse traditions. Uh, we see the swastika again, uh, which in Indian tradition is a symbol of peace and harmony, with a Celtic sign, Triskeles, uh, consisting of a triple spiral, ex uh, um, exhibit, exhibiting a rotational symmetry. And I don't know if the triangle uh, alludes to the Egyptian tradition, but you can see that there is a syncretic iconography that she uh, waves. So here in two untitled painting, we can uh, also see that she refers to the iconography of Christian liturgy, like the uh, ostensory. Uh, the depiction of the theme of the grail indeed seems to have fascinated her, maybe in the sense of the quest of the higher self. What is striking is the impulse of rotative and radiating movement in the geometric patterns that led Natalie Bell to speak of an accelerated energy with an esoteric semiotics. For what I know, Olga frobe captain gave a conference in 1930 with Alice Ann Bailey, uh, so the uh, theosophist, and um, in an exhibition comprised of 80 paintings, uh, but I am still uh, waiting an answer to the archive uh, in Eranos to see if uh, Fröbe wrote a text in relation to it. That would be wonderful if we can discover more um, about the intent, the function of her images, because we know very little until uh, so far. So in 1930, uh, she um, decided to uh, reproduce with the, the technique of, sc of screen print 14 uh, of these um, meditation uh, painting. She revealed creating these, work, uh, these works in a med meditative states, uh, state, and as I said, in which she also envisions, though, in 1927, the building of a temple. This temple would take shape first as a center for spiritual research with the Theosophist Alice Ann Bailey, and then become the Eranos project, marked by the collaboration with Carl Gustav Jung. Eranos, which means a banquet where everyone should bring a meal to share in Greek, will be through the years an equally intimate place for her research on spirituality and symbolism and the collective laboratory for interdisciplinary conference on the history of culture. The name Eranos has been inspired by Rudolf Otto, a researcher on religious phenomenology. The symposia presented talks on archaeology, comparative religion, theology, history of art, and ethnology, among others. The very first symposium was held in 1933 under the theme of yoga and meditation in the East and the West. Frobe Captain chose the theme uh, of the summer symposia and edited for 30 years until her death the book containing its proceedings, writing the preface for each of it. A gong played in the order to signify the beginning and the end of the talks, as well as the breaks. A sculpture outside in the garden was inscribed with genius loci in noto, to the, to the unknown genius of the place. 
and corresponded to the spirit to which Olga Fröbe refers when she talks about the great organizer of the symposia. I quote, an invisible spirit of these meetings, a spirit that is simply abroad, that is present, that is almost a presence, and that is linked to those who speak and those who listen. It is linked to the landscape and to the garden in which the lecture hall stands. So her home, hosted in the following summers around the round, round table, speakers like Mircea Eliade and Erwin Schrödinger. Even during World War II, Olga Fröbe Kaptein decided to maintain the symposium, even if for just one speaker and a listener, as an act of resistance. Olga Fröbe, who said in 1939, it often looks as if Eranos has created a magical circle, a mandala, in which the work can proceed in spite of the of difficulties of the times. Olga died in her home in 1962, but the Eranos conferences are still held today. And which is interesting here is that you can um, see that she keeps repeating um, this iconography of a, of a temple. Olga Fröbe accorded the primal, uh, primordial importance to images. She said, the deepest thing in human life can only be expressed in images, and I am speaking through images. This is the way my mind works. For uh, the, the mandala, as Giovanni Sorge asserts, became a central key for interpreting Ernos and the meditative form to perceive, and in this way to drive, the development of Ernos. For Sorge, the association of Eranos with the mandala is a symbol of the self, and on the other hand, the mandala is also uh, a tool of meditation and concentration, allowing the rise of awareness. Depicting Eranos as a mandala is also a tool, um, um, Sorry, depicting Eranos as a mandala, uh, she transforms it into a symbol, a symbol of a human cycle, mirroring a superior sphere thanks to the integration of a common task of renewal. So Giovanni Sorge recognizes a possible fil rouge between these paintings uh, that you've seen of the temples that are um, made in the 30s and uh, the mandala that she drew uh, around 47, 48. A fil rouge that is still to be investigated, but that makes sense in the way she uses a, a, diagram, a diagrammatic uh, thinking. So from 1934, Olga Fröbe uh, progressively entered in a new figurative and autobiographical phase, embracing the idea of the Jungian uh, active imagination through the creation of a uh, series of drawings that she called the visions. Basically, it can be thought of uh, an interpretation of a mental state through drawing and writing. Very. Uh, finally, Olga Fröbe Kaptein's fascination with iconography led her also to build a thematic photographical archive comprised of about 6,500 items spanning from depictions of paintings, sculpture, artifacts to symbols from all, all over the world. A large selection of the collection concerned the archetype of the great mother that she curated according the, to the conferences. Here you have uh, some examples. Uh, in the background you can see the meditative uh, drawings, Jung in, the, in, the, in front, who is listening to a conference. And here, as, uh, here you have the selection of images um, from Olga Fröbe Kaptein's iconographic collection, which is now uh, in the Warburg Institute. So I'm not going to focus more on that, but it is intri intriguing. Um, it would be an intriguing topic to further investigate. It is partially uh, linked to her biography because she was called uh, the mother or the great mother within uh, the Aeronauts conferences by um, the speakers. 
And sometimes she felt completely overwhelmed uh, by this uh, iconography. And um, especially when she uh, traveled to Greece, she recalled in a, in a correspondence uh, being completely obsessed and almost it was too much for her, too much images and too much uh, maybe um, comparison with these kinds of images. Um, interestingly, a part of this material has been published by Eric Neumann, uh, a psychologist and a pupil of Jung, in a text that for um, 1954 uh, sounds uh, avant-garde. This is the uh, lecture hall today. Um, so maybe I quote, but this problem of the feminine has equal importance for the psychologists of culture who recognizes that the peril of present day mankind springs in large part from the one-sidedly patriarchal development of the male intellectual consciousness, which is no longer kept in balance by the matriarchal world of the psyche. In this sense, the exposition of the archetypal uh, psyche psychical world of the feminine that we have attempted in our work is also a contribution to a future therapy of culture. So, and what about Emma Kunz? Uh, Emma Kunz comes from a very diverse background. Uh, she was born in 1892 in now in the center of the German-speaking part of Switzerland, uh, within a modest context. She earned her living working in a knit factory and as a maid for a wealthy painter who portrayed her as a pastoral muse. A strong, intuitive woman, she was eager to learn and kept herself informed of, uh, on scientific and esoteric concepts uh, found in popular science journals. She talked with chemists who helped her developing her remedies and cultivated the fascination for the new world that opened her up through the lens of a microscope. When her healing practice uh, and unconventional way of life, because she never married and had no children, became too suspicious for the authorities, uh, she moved to the small canton of Appenzell in the far east of Switzerland, where alternative healers were and still are today well accepted. There in the phone book, she inscribed as her profession, Drove's Woman. Emma Kunz published a collection of poems Life, and in 1953, self-published two almost ident identical theoretical booklets about her methods of drawing, the miracle, the miracle of creative revelation, and new methods of drawing, both both subtitle, design, and form as measure, rhythm, symbol, and transformation of number and principle. Her booklets inform us that she envisaged her images as a record of energetic flux in and around crystals, plants, animals, and humans. Yet, in the conciseness of her explanations, she remained cryptic, choosing not to unveil how she toyed with the numbers at the core of her practice, neither how she used her pendulum. A tool today, the pendulum, conserved at the Emma Kuhn Center with three uh, note sketchbooks uh, and more than 400 drawings realized from 1938 until her death. The Emma Kunz Centrum, um, built in 1986 by a former patient of Emma Kunz, uh, opened also a museum in 1991. So regarding her creative protocols and biography, the main sources are the reports by eyewitnesses and entourage who passed down quotations and information that told and retold contributed to create also her legendary persona. Maybe. In the 50s, the large-scale diagrams uh, drawn on graph paper by Emma Kunz were hang hanging in layers on the wall of a home, as we can see here, close to the Santis Mountain in Appenzell, ready to be used and reused for diagnosis or prognostics. According to her former patient, Emma Kunz drew standing using the grid of the graph paper weighed down at the table to mark gravity centers uh, following the virtual forms of her pendulum on a wooden board. This board 
may have worked as an orientation uh, as an orientation tool to draw coordinates that report uh, then reported on the grid of a graph paper. The combination of numbers then deter determined the shape, as she says in her method, but without explaining how. And um, this is the first drawing that opens her methods and maybe is interesting because um, it allows us to think and to understand a little bit how she considered consider drawing as a language and as a semiotics. So she could use and reuse these kind of uh, the forms that she uh, augmented, that she repeated, that she combined. So once she um, had the gravity centers marked on the graph paper with dots, she then wove with a ruler and pencils a net of pulsating lines in a state of concentration that might have brought to her, uh, that, uh, that might have brought to her mind images in which she saw the operating forces in nature. Once accomplished, Kuntz reused her drawings for new interpretations. That she, gave, uh, that she gave only or orally. She also reproduced and framed her drawings at a smaller scale and sometimes offered them to her patients. We, we saw in the previous image the little uh, framed drawings uh, and sometimes offered them to her patients, perhaps like talismans. Talismans were agency, representation and aesthetic uh, meet. So this is an interesting drawing, all, uh, drawing also because um, we can see here how uh, she um, was involved in a long process. Uh, and this is the, so we don't have any information about her methods, her protocols by herself, but only by um, reported speech. But the materiality of the drawing speaks by themselves, so uh, you, we can have marked on it. And this is striking here on the left. So uh, she used uh, these axes and then she combined numbers. Uh, so I don't know if there are the numbers of time that the pendulum rotated, or I, we actually don't know exactly how she played and with, the, with the number, but it's interesting to see that um, you can see these marks on the drawings themselves. And I was talking before of the, the fact that she was seeing uh, uh, vital forces um, in nature um, and fluxes, and um, here's two of the drawings that she reproduced in her methods, uh, where the, she says, for example, uh, the, the, the title of the, the, the drawing here is the circle in relation with other numbs builds up crystal forms, or you, or you have uh, here, uh, the circle develops vegetal forms in relation to numerical measurements. So, and this is also interesting to understand that she uh, probably understood her drawings uh, in movements. So they were not static, but they were uh, always uh, in flux, and this is perhaps the, the way she, she uh, meant it, them. So this is the wood board with the pendulum uh, in, uh, in the right, all her uh, instrumentarium. Um, a drawing that she made and is, uh, is used today uh, as the logo of her healing powder. Uh, it is a, a healing powder that she extracted in a grotto uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Aarau. Um, and with this power, uh, this is pow with this power, she is said to have uh, healed um, a little boy of uh, polio. And this is the little boy that then opened up uh, the cultural, uh, the Zema Kunstzentrum. Uh, but the, the drawing is interesting because it seems to embed, uh, according to the report of a former patient, uh, four states uh, of the body. So, um, um, 
And with practice, um, human can elevate themselves to a transcendent state. Also, the drawings emanate ray and energy. So this is the, um, the conception that you couldn't find actually in esoteric uh, literature. Um, rays uh, are in the iconography used to symbolize the presence of the sacred also, but also in an analogy with telecommunications and vibrations invisible to the bare eye, they have a long history uh, within esoteric literature. They can be related with electricity, and electricity is charged, uh, charged if I can say that, um, in a, you know, of a vital, uh, vital, almost a miraculous, at least Promethean function from century, if uh, we think of uh, the creature of Frankenstein, for example, in the Gothic imagination. So in esoteric literature, to, from Mesmer to Annie Besant, and closer to Olga Fröbe-Kaptein in the books by Alice and Bailey, we find the idea that everything radiates also the forms. And in radiesthetic drawings, the so-called waveforms uh, are used to heal also at distance. In a book by Maria Frausem, summing up the knowledge and radiesthesia in that time, um, an analogy is made between radiesthesists and artists. Ornaments, um, of course, the, the drawings of Emma Kunz are, uh, have a, a very ornamental quality um, that can, of course, be related to the process of, of, of abstraction, uh, and it's um, even in the, the, the etymology, the et etymology of abstraction, like abtraere, to, to draw, uh, as, a, as a process of essentialization from uh, nature. So we have seen the that Emma Kuntz uh, draws the vital forces of nature in her process of abstracting the forms. But the presence of ornaments is uh, ancestral. Um, Alfred Gell showed uh, their agency in his book. Um, these aniconic patterns are not only signs, but they, they can also have an apotropic function. Um, but Ornaments also, also adorn textiles. It can be reminded here that Emma Kunz too had um, a practice uh, of waving uh, when she was a young woman. At the beginning of her method, she says that she used straight lines also for the drawing of a parabola. In such ways, the repetitive rhythm uh, and gesture of waving has probably informed her practice of drawing. This drawing here is interesting because it presents a prism. Um, this is the way her drawing is entitled in her method, uh, and which uh, bears uh, similarities with textile uh, patterns. Uh, this is a, a book of model uh, that was circulating in uh, around 19, uh, in 1938 um, in, uh, in Switzerland in knit factories. And a thing that I didn't mention yet is that Emma Kuntz, apart in her method, uh, didn't give titles uh, of her drawings, and neither a date. So the numbers that uh, you can find now when you see actually the drawings of Emma Kuntz have been um, given for uh, in uh, inventory reasons, uh, uh, probably by uh, uh, her um, former patient or uh, the, um, the first directors of the museum who exhibited her work. And our, I'm finishing. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, ornaments can also help um, to envision a higher dimension, a fourth dimension, a sort of a meta-reality where gravity does, does not exist and where the mind is liberated from the body, a sort of awareness. We find these theories about the fourth dimension um, that used the analogy with mathematics uh, very frequently in esoteric literature, also in Rudolf Steiner. Linda Dalrymple Henderson, again, the researcher who coined the term uh, vibratory, uh, uh, vibratory modernism, uh, has shown its impact uh, on artistic practice. 
Uh, here is a reproduction of a book by architect and theosophist Claude Bragdon at the, in the right um, that theorizes it. It is for now just an, an, an assumption, but it may be that Emma Kunz uh, had also in mind um, within her practice uh, this idea that uh, painting or, or drawing ornaments can, can bring her to a higher um, awareness. So the art world is rediscovering today these influential figures of the past within the context of their emblematic elder sisters, Ilma of Klint, Georgina Houghton, Agnes Spelton, and Josefa Tolra, among others. Uh, the progressive valorization of women's work, posthumanist and the holistic worldviews, but also the expansion of the, the categorization of art and beliefs today uh, play a role in the enhancement of a creativity that until recently has been marginalized. A creativity that in many ways will have anticipated the debates uh, on the power and functions of art. Their art, research, and figures open up then to speculative projections and um, artic artistic dialogues, also because of the lack of um, research uh, by now, but artistic dialogues uh, that drive a creative force in their own and uh, make us reflect upon uh, our society in a past future sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm.